There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. Beyond the Darkness is on the air. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Tonight we're going to talk to a guest who has uh, definitely taken the upper hand in uh, trying to walk people through the paranormal that have an interest and a fascination in ghosts, UFOs, cryptozoology. He's written now his sixth book. His latest effort is Handbook for the Amateur UFO Investigator and... uh, just an amazing deal, Brian. I mean, you've been working on these for how long, putting together all of these different books? Uh, the book's probably about 10 years. And 10 that years. comes about after another 10 years of being in the field. I didn't feel qualified to write about this stuff and you know, right away. And it seems like nowadays, you know, somebody watch a TV show and they want to write a book. But for me, I really felt like I needed to know not just what I'm talking about, but also have that experience behind me to back that up and i needed to kind of i guess understand what i was talking about to explain it to somebody else what you had to understand yeah, what you were talking Jeez. about before you wrote a book that's new it's an amazing <laughs> thing i know oh well, you know a lot of people just i don't want to say copy and paste stuff but they just kind of regurgitate other information and i wanted to you know i saw a lot of problems in the paranormal field and you know it's no different right now there's plenty of problems going on political issues and backstabbing and all these other things, but also I, I think a, a little bit of a misunderstanding of science and, and the process of science and a lot of different things. So my whole goal with my initial set of books, and six books, is this, it's just my start, I hope. And with that is just to kind of lower the learning curve of people coming into these anomalous research fields because for me, I didn't have that. I didn't have somebody to help me out or to teach me or train me. I had to learn all this stuff on my own and actually read other people's books. So thinking of, you know, maybe I can get people to read these books too and kind of lower that learning curve. And kind of my goal with these books also is to provide a balanced look. It's not, hey, I believe in this. Do you want to believe in this too? Here's my book and we can believe together and sing campfire songs. No, it's it's – I'm providing the stories and the research and the information, and basically these are guidebooks. I've written essentially four different uh, ghost guidebooks, a cryptid guidebook, and this UFO guidebook. And it's basically here's the information. Do with it as you please. If you want to believe, go ahead. If you don't want to believe, there's also information in there that you'll understand and accept as well. So it's it's so kind of – So it as an objective overview and yeah, keeping and, some of your slant out of the book. Well, some of my slant is there, but right, obviously. You know, but I mean, you're not trying. Wanna... You're not trying to convert the uh, the innocent. You're trying to bring in for the people that already want to be there and are, are interested in doing this. You're giving them the opportunity to read, follow along, read what's come before them, and make up their own mind in this. You're not pushing an agenda either way. Absolutely, and and somebody who's into uh, not into cryptozoology is not going to pick up my book, even if they heard me speak somewhere. And you know, they're obviously there to hear me speak or they're looking through Amazon for a book because they want to believe in a certain subject matter. So it's it's obvious that I have to sort of slant in that direction, but at the right. same time, I want to bring them a balanced overview. And, and I've really tried hard to do that. And even reaching out to the skeptical community to review my book and to, and to look at it and, and to be honest with me about it. And that was my goal. It's easy to write a, a Bigfoot book and have – believers in cryptozoology read and go, hey, yeah, that's a good book. I mean, they may argue points, but it's going to be accepted pretty widely. But to have a book on cryptozoology or UFOs to be accepted by the skeptical community, good luck. It's not easy. So that's kind of been my 
my proud moment is is having a, a positive review in the Skeptical Inquirer, which is one of the largest skeptical magazines in the world. So that was a, a shining moment for me. Well, I want to I want to touch on different aspects of all of your books tonight, but I wanted to start off kind of heavily into the cryptozoology because personally, that is something that I would have more of an interest. I, I mean, I've gone into paranormal investigations now for 12, 13 years. I've had strange encounters with ghosts throughout most of my life. So I, that's something that I, I'm more versed on. And I got to tell you, I'm getting more and more courage to do the out, out of doors thing. And my wife is pushing me to get out and explore more. And the idea of going after cryptozoological creatures to investigate these claims, you know, it, part of me feels like, yeah, let's do this. Because what, what are the real chances I'm going to run into a Bigfoot or a Dogman, right? Right. <laughs> what are the real chances? But but there is that opportunity of maybe finding that magic that's out there, the, the bent trees, the nesting qualities, some of the other things that seem to be left behind, which to me are just as fascinating on this. But talk to me a little bit about what your uh, – process was in beginning to investigate cryptozoological claims, because to me, that's one of the hardest of the fields to investigate, um, simply because it seems those moments are so fleeting and most people's encounters are brief and, you know, in and out and it's done. Whereas a lot of times people that believe in UFOs have seen them for a long time, believe that they've been abducted. So you've got, you know, history and longer stories of this, uh, but, but, Start me off at the beginning here, and again, for our listeners checking us out, Brian D. Parsons, Ph.D., our guest today, and we're going to be talking about his different handbooks, but starting off with the cryptozoological aspects of this. Well, in all honesty, I when I started into anomalous research, I started in the ghost field, and I really didn't have any kind of feel for cryptozoology at all, although I was kind of influenced by uh, In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy, you know, seeing that the Patterson Gimlin clip there at the beginning of that show, it caught me every time. And it, I guess that kind of opened the door for me a little bit, but I was in the ghost field for, for quite a while. And then I'm also an outdoors person. I'm not a hunter or anything, but I do enjoy backpacking, camping, hiking. And, you know, throughout my twenties, I pushed myself further and further to, to stay out later and longer and, you know, two, three nights and, and hike longer distances. So, you know, I was really connected with nature. So, it was really a natural step for me to do it. But um, back in, in the early days of, of me getting into this field, uh, the cryptid people and the ghost people and the UFO people, we didn't quite get along. So it was it was kind of – I had to kind of study on the side a little bit. And, and it was interesting because cryptozoology to me offered me a little bit more tangible of an opportunity you know, to, to see something – physical versus a ghost where it's it's made essentially a hallucination almost for lack of a better term between a client and the environment what's going on there you really can't capture it you know you can try to get evps or you can try to get uh, photographs and different things but how do you really know that there's that actual connection there it's it's really tough and it's it's very subjective so i thought you know this is a good chance to get into something a little bit more objective and have the opportunity to, to maybe not capture something tangible, but to capture evidence that's more tangible, footprints or, or broken right. branches or, you know, like you said, twisted trees and, and all these other things that are associated with uh, Bigfoot or even other creatures. And, you know, Bigfoot is the big draw. It's what everyone's uh, attracted to, at least here in the United States. It's, uh, you know, the big thing here. And, you know, other countries, you might have the thylacine or you might even have Yowie down in Australia or uh, alien big cats in the United Kingdom. So, you know, no matter where you go, you have different kind of focus. But yeah, I guess Bigfoot is is the big one all over the place. And whenever you read anything about cryptozoology, it's Bigfoot. You know, cryptid conferences are mainly Bigfoot conferences. They're not really cryptozoological conferences, which is, I think, kind of a ripoff. But, you know, the Bigfoot is the, the big guy. And it's uh, it's an interesting way to start out, but I, I kind of branched off and just looked at these as mysteries, solving mysteries, the same as you do a ghost case. You're you're going in, you have a client, they saw something, it was a spontaneous sighting, they didn't expect it, maybe something ran in front of their car, something was in their backyard, and you just go through the interview process and you, you try to establish what they saw and uh, you know try to 
figure out the size and the shape and what it could have been. And for me, I always start out at the logical step. You know, what could have this creature have been versus, wow, you saw something that was eight foot, it had to be Bigfoot. You know, I don't want to go in that direction first. I want to kind of problem solve and, you know, put the kind of the Scooby-Doo effect into effect and try to, you know, pull the mask off of the person instead of falling in love with this uh, potential cryptid creature that could be out there. So it is almost kind of like investigating a ghost case. You're kind of approaching it uh, as long as it's a client-based kind of situation. You should be interviewing the client and finding out what they think they saw or what they felt they saw. And you can't, you can't take that experience away. Whatever they experienced, whatever they say, that's their experience. And I have right. to go with that. Uh, but, you know, then you take that information, you look for evidence, and you try to add it all together, but you allow all that stuff to speak. You don't use your your emotions or your perspective or your opinions or your your thoughts get in the way. And that's the same with ghosts. But it's it's a little bit more of a kind of a more physical thing than the ghost thing because you have the opportunity to potentially find something out there. But then you, the, the more and more you do this, you realize that there's a lot of subjectivity and there's a lot of misidentification and a lot of the same problems you have in the ghost field, unfortunately, with clients seeing things that aren't really there or their perception of something that isn't really what actually happened. You know, maybe they saw what they thought was a Bigfoot was actually a bear or, you know, another creature that they just misinterpreted. You know, that mountain lion that they thought they saw was actually a house cat that they just had a misperception of size at a distance because they weren't used to seeing a house cat in a particular area. So you kind of run into the same issues. It's just packaged differently with a different name, and um, it's all kind of the same thing. You're really just solving mysteries. When you go out and investigate, and, and as part of your book, when you're going to interview someone, what are you looking for? What are the key elements to tell you that there's a good chance that what this person says they honestly believe? I'm not saying that they're that they're um, that they actually saw Bigfoot, because again, as you said, it's all subjective. But what do you look for to see that they're being sincere to you in what what they're conveying is what they believe truly to be paranormal in nature, either ghosts or 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 Bigfoot or or UFOs? What is that? Is are, are there different? triggers in every different field? Well, I think with ghosts, it's there's a lot more symbolism between what they're seeing and experiencing and something attached to who they are as a person uh, versus a, a cryptological thing, a, a sighting. It's just it's a fleeting glance at something that they don't understand. And uh, a lot of times they'll just attach it to whatever their belief system is. So it's a little easier to pry those two things apart. Uh, a, a ghost situation is much more detailed, and and I use a, a much more thorough interviewing process. I use what's called the cognitive interview, which is what uh, a lot of police use and the FBI uses to really dig deep into a person's sight, you know, their sighting, and and look at it from different angles and allow them to go back and forth to kind of rehash and find more detail because it's all in the detail with the ghost sighting. Now the 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 cryptozoological thing, not so as, as, as much, unless it's historical and I don't have any kind of evidence to go on. Then I kind of want to know exactly what they were doing beforehand or, you know, their thoughts about this stuff and where do they get their information from, kind of their background and their perception and their beliefs about all this stuff. Same as in the ghost field. You should really know all that going in. You know, do they have a, a whole pile of exorcist DVDs and, and TV shows and stuff that they're you know, looking at, or is that their influence or are they influenced by their religion? Uh, you know, what's, what's causing them to potentially think of, of these things. And, you know, talking ghost field, you know, a lot of times it's a cry for help in other things. I've met a lot of people that have had marital issues or alcohol dependency issues or even drug addictions that it kind of came up. And then it's that really honestly, and at that point that we have to, say adieu and say that we can't help you because, you know, I'm not, even if I did have a licensed counselor in the group, it's a tremendously large legal issue that you really don't want to get involved in. So you right. pretty much have to put them into somebody else's hands. But, you know, you did your part. You solved the the mystery. So it's an accomplishment. Then you have to hope that they get the help that they, they need. Um, it doesn't always happen just in ghost issues. Sometimes I've had Bigfoot cases that have turned out to be 
essentially cries for help that, you know, these people saw something and they swear it was what they saw. And I know what I saw kind of thing. And, you know, you get to talking to them and you, you allow that bond to happen and they open up to you and then they start telling you all their problems and you're like, uh oh, maybe this wasn't a Bigfoot. Really? Now on the ghost side, I can see that, but on the Bigfoot side, that's, that's new to me. That, that, that perception that it may be something else that's a cry for help. I'm sure it's rare, but, uh, you know, I've come across it a couple of times, which kind of, you know, it makes me see that correlation between those types of cases. Right. And, uh, you know, you have mental people with mental disorders, unfortunately, and, and in the paranormal stuff, it, it just, it's, you know, fantasy prone behavior and all these other things and belief in, in crazy things. And I mean, sometimes it's all tied in, not all the time, but, um, I don't know why. Sometimes I just take those cases, even though I know it's going to happen, but it's, it's just about helping people. When you're taking these kinds of cases, these people are looking for answers and they need guidance. They need help and they need empowerment more than anything, you know, especially in a ghost case. Once, once the client feels like they're in control of a ghost case, the ghost usually goes away. And a lot of times when you help somebody understand what somebody might have seen in a cryptozoological sighting, they they become a little bit more relaxed about it and they, they'll admit, you know, maybe that was a bear or maybe that maybe I did misinterpret the size of this cat. Uh even when you and then you can show them, you know, with using different sizes of objects and you know, they can come to terms with that uh, a little bit better. But it's all about helping people, bottom line. Tell me about um, – I'm fascinated as you're talking to people regarding their Bigfoot encounters. What can you relate to us as, as what you found to be one of the most credible and compelling encounters that you researched? Uh, personal accounts or, you know, that I've investigated um, – I don't know. I'm harder on my stuff than I am other people's stuff, to be honest with you. But no, but I'm sure you've talked to quite a few people out there. Out of the stories that you've collected and you've you've investigated of other people's claims, what was one of the most compelling stories that you've been told that you believe has some substance to it? Uh, I mean, I've met I've met people that have essentially, when I offered them logical solutions, they they started crying. This one woman started crying and said, "I know exactly what I saw. This is exactly what I saw." This is what it looked like. This is the hair color. This is the movement. And it wasn't a per, I mean, these people on more than one occasion, I mean, this one lady was in tears and she just was distraught about this days after weeks after it happened even. So I, you know, I had to believe her. And like I said before, I, if you said you saw something and you experienced it, I can't take that away from you. But to see somebody that has passion and those kind of emotions versus somebody that gets mad at you and, slams the door and says, get out if you don't believe me. I, I've had that happen a number of times as well. And those I kind of question a little bit more. But to see somebody who was actually upset that, the, and they're scared, you know, I know I saw this and this is exactly what it looked like. And I was, you know, I'm a sane person. And, you know, they have character witnesses essentially that, you know, I, I can't question it and I can't come up with any kind of logical answer. That's, you know, when I'm a loss for words, that's it's a rare time for me, to be honest, because I, I love to find explanations for everything. And when these people could tell me a story and, and she can swear up and down that she saw a Bigfoot setting and, and believe it or not, during the day, not at night, um, I, you know, when I can't I can't debunk it or I can't figure out a logical explanation for it. And I'm left to, you know, just I have no choice but to believe in it, you know, even though everything in my mind is telling me this isn't logical, this isn't probably real, but this person truly, honestly believes this beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, it's rare, but I've encountered that a, a few times, and it's 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 kind of inspiring in a way, because when you go case to case and you're able to find logical solutions, you become almost more skeptical of the field. But when you meet somebody that has that much passion about their sighting, and they're not, again, they're not angry about it. They're not mad that you don't believe them or can offer a logical solution. You know, when, you know, what am I supposed to say? It's just like, I, I know you believe what you saw and you're, you're trying to make me a believer. And, and, you know, sometimes I do believe them. Right. Is there a story that stood out specifically to you about, you know, one of these encounters that you still recall? 
Uh, well, just this lady that I was talking about, she's uh, fairly local to where I live, probably about uh, 20, well, maybe 25, 30 miles away in uh, a county that's heavily, if you look at the BFRO website, they've had uh, a lot of encounters in the 80s and early 90s, but really nothing since. And this this woman swears that she saw this thing crossing a, a very large open field, uh, really no bear in this area. Uh, in, in this part of Ohio, we don't – at the time, I mean, now there's been numerous bear sightings. But the way she described this creature moving across a field, and she was fairly close to it. And when it discovered that she was watching it, it kind of was almost as shocked as she was. And she said it just turned around and ran away. And it, the way she described it and the, the, the words and her description and how she described the, the noises from this thing, even if it, when it was moving – the descriptions and what the color of the, of the hair and the type of hair. And, you know, she even had a blanket that she's like, it's kind of like this. And, you know, just the, the vivid descriptions that this woman gave me, it just blew me away. Cause I'd never heard anything like that. And when she rehashed her story and I kind of made her tell it from different angles and different story, different uh, directions and uh, kind of rewind and forward wind, she, she got really teared up and really, She's like, I can't believe I saw this, but I know I saw this, and there's nothing that you can tell me that is not it. And this was, uh, let's see, probably about 2012, 2013, just about four or five years ago. So it still, to me, is one of the most compelling cases that I've personally investigated. You know, but I, I – talk to other researchers and I hear their stories too, but I, it's, it's hard for me to question another researcher because, you know, I don't know their techniques or I don't know their, you know, their interview or what they did or, so I tend to take their stuff more at face value than I do my stuff. I'm more critical of uh, my information and, and my cases, but that one, yeah, she, uh, she really had me going. She really had me feeling like there was definitely something going on out there. And I spent, I actually spent a lot more time out there hiking and, um, ended up kayaking out there for a few years, looking around and keeping a very watchful eye in that area, but have not heard anything since, unfortunately. Let me ask you a quick question here. Okay, you've, you've obviously investigated claims of the paranormal, the ghost side of it. You've uh, now, with your new book, looking into UFO uh, sightings. I, I understand the ghost side of it. People want to investigate. They want proof that there is an afterlife, that the soul survives our physical plane. And that will give us some comfort. That and 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 if we see that ghost and they're there, maybe we can interact and we can talk to it. And then you have people that are fascinated by UFOs and aliens, and they want an encounter. And again, maybe it's because they'll be the one that gets selected, or they'll be able to communicate with these beings. That I understand. <laughs> Bigfoot, not so much. What is the game plan for you as an investigator, Brian Parsons? <laughs> If you're out know, in the I, woods and you round that corner and there is a Bigfoot, do you plan on offering him half of a jelly sandwich? Do you turn and run? What What is the game plan, the end result for for an investigator? That's what I've always been curious about regarding the animal aspect of this. Well, you know, in that situation, everybody would say that they would do one thing, but I think we'd all probably do something very different if we encountered something in the woods. <laughs> I mean, I would hope that I would be able to – I always think that I would run after it and try to, you know, dig my – fingernails into it and grab some dna and do something heroic wow, that's okay i don't know but you know, you know something but sure i'm sure something else i'd probably just stand there in terror and not be able to move uh you know but you raise some really really good perspective on this and this is how i have i have always looked at the ghost field as people that get into this are are either searching for spiritual answers or the the big answers that mankind has always looked at is you know where do we come from where do we go when we die? You know, and, you know what? Is, what can answer all these things? Well, ghosts. You know, so ghosts have have been a part of civilization for thousands of years. I mean, since we began burying our dead, even before Homo sapiens, there was more than likely a belief in in the afterlife. So that's a huge connection, and it's no wonder that we're studying ghosts in this day and age. And and obviously, what you said about UFOs, because it's it's beyond us. What is beyond humans what is beyond earth other than the spiritual aspect what is what is out there is there anything intelligent out there 
uh, hopefully more intelligent than us. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, obviously those two big things. But I think when it comes to cryptozoology, I think it's it's almost of what is here? What do we not know about our own planet? What is undiscovered? What is discovered? Does science have all the answers? And, you know, that's the, the fight between cryptozoology and zoology and other animal sciences is cryptozoologists believe in the folkloric aspect. They believe something exists beyond what is known. So it's kind of that fight between what we know and what we don't know or what we think we know. So I think it's kind of like almost pushing against, you know, general knowledge. I mean, for me, again, it just comes down to, to solving mysteries. And I enjoy nature, and I love animals. But you know, when you've actually of- gone out on an investigation, every investigator I've spoken to, I see it, it throws a monkey wrench into it. I go, okay, so you're going out and investigating, and what is the game plan if you catch them? And, you know, like you said, it's interesting. We probably all say we're going to do one thing, and we end up, you know, reacting completely differently. But I'm, I'm just always curious why somebody isn't wearing a constant body camera. Right. Uh, you know, why all of these Bigfoot investigators aren't wearing GoPros at all times so that there isn't the, the excuse. Hey, I, cause personally, Brian, I had a Bigfoot encounter when I was a kid. I saw it and, and I've had a UFO encounter and the idea of pulling my camera out didn't even occur to me at the time. I just wanted to see it and I wanted to get closer to it. So we have enough technology now that a real investigator you would think should be you should have a camera roll in front and back at all times because if you're truly out there investigating, I'm not sure that we're not being followed by these beings in the woods. If we're out there and they're aware that we're out there, how many times are we missing them because we're we're looking forward and they're moving around behind us? Yeah, it's funny too because people always say, well, how come we have all this technology? Everybody has a phone now. It's 2017. I, we know I can get it in the 1960s or the 1970s or even the 80s with those ginormous uh, cameras that we used to carry. But, you know, it's I was hiking. Actually, I was walking in a public park around where I live about a mile away, and I saw this mouse run out in front of me, and I was just walking, and I just I stopped and just watched it run. And my phone was in my pocket, and I kind of laughed. Like, I made no effort to pull out my phone because I was in, in, engaged in watching it. It was just kind of like, okay, Mr. Mouse, it's kind of weird to see you during the day. It was kind of neat. It was a fun, exciting thing. But then I, I kind of laughed about it later on. Like, I made no effort to film this, even though it was, you know, if I told the story, nobody, you know, nobody might believe me about this thing. And, you know, I think it, you know, with a Bigfoot, it might be the same thing that you might be in, in awe of seeing this. But for me, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I am really not a fan of, I mean, I like expeditions, don't get me wrong, going out and looking for this stuff, but I'm not a fan of the approach. I mean, honestly, knocking on trees and screaming in the woods are two of the dumbest things I've ever seen. I'm going to be honest. It, it just does not appeal to me at all. Uh, I, I enjoy being out in the woods and, and looking for signs of, of anything, uh, whether it's mountain lions uh, here in the east that they're not supposed to exist or you know, Bigfoot, signs for Bigfoot, but I'm not a fan of the approaches. I, I think it's just a little ridiculous, and I think it's very subjective. It's the same as the ghost field, turning the lights off and running around in the dark with a flashlight, you know, putting yourself in a situation in the woods in the middle of the night in the same exact thing with a flashlight. You're setting yourself up for failure, and you're setting yourself up for subjective experience that no matter what you hear out there, it's automatically going to be a Bigfoot. You can't, You can't prove it. But you can't disprove it either. So I'm not really a big fan of putting myself in a situation like that. Not that I'm, a, I'm not a, I'm not afraid of it. I could, I could spend the night in the woods, no problem. It doesn't bother me. But uh, it's just, you know, you hear something. How do you prove it? What are you going to go running through the woods in the middle of the night and hope you don't get tied up in a pricker bush to to tackle something right. in, the, in the middle of the night or <laughs> pull out your pull out your nine millimeter and start firing in the dark? And then you end up killing somebody. I mean, that's a bigger mess. So it's to me, it's a lose-lose situation to go and to do these things. I mean, if you're in a an area where you've had multiple cases and you're, you know, you've scouted this area and you've, you've have a bunch of teams set up, that's a different story. But that's not something I've ever heard anybody do. So I, I don't see it being done the way I would do it. Um, but I do enjoy getting out with guys that that like doing this stuff and and learning from them and, and their approaches. But you know, when we start hearing 
things snap and we all, oh my gosh, it's a Bigfoot. No, it's, you don't know. You know, deer, any kind of noise you hear at night is amplified because of the atmosphere and because of the fact it's dark and you can't, your eyes can't see. So your mind makes it sound much, much larger than what it really is. So yeah, I'm not really a fan of that kind of approach, to be honest. I'm, I'm more of a, I'm a boots on the ground kind of guy, uh, but I want to follow up the way it happened. If somebody saw it during the day, why would I go into an area at night? You know, I would rather be there, you know, where the, in the situation in which it happened. And, and I think that really what's going on with the Bigfoot field is, is almost like piggybacking on these approaches of the ghost field. Like, Hey, let's do it at night. This IR camera looks cool on TV. Let's go and do it. And, and unfortunately, uh, monkey see monkey do. We see it on TV. We want to do that as a, as a group as well. And, you know, I get the, you got to kept, you know, catch it at, when it's not expecting it and all this other, all this other stuff. But it, to me, it just doesn't make sense. It's just not logical to do that. I mean, why can't you go out during the day? Why can't you go looking for Bigfoot in the middle of the afternoon? What's the difference? I'm sure you can. Most does actual he, encounters take place hide? during the day, right? right? Most, exactly. most of them do. Yes. And I would much rather go hunting for them in the day where you can find better <laughs> evidence of it uh, and and be aware if you are surrounded, if there are more than one of them out there. And and that's when most people have had their most profound experiences. The most frightening ones seem to always occur at night. And again, is it because it's nighttime and and people are, you know, washing their dishes and they look out the window and it's standing outside their cabin, you know, those moments are going to be a lot more chilling because it is nighttime. And you often wonder how much less terrifying would the experience be if it was broad daylight and you were washing dishes and Chewbacca walked up to your back door, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you're you kind of able to see it and see what else is going on around it. Not that it wouldn't be any less bizarre, but it might be a lot less frightening because it's not nighttime and they can't quickly dart into the woods and then you don't know if they're still there or not. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And and you're leveling the playing field by being out there during the day. And, you know, you're, like you said, you're more aware of your surroundings and what's going on around you. And you can find evidence a lot easier. You know, footprints are a lot easier to see um, usually early morning or in early evening when the sun is at a nice angle. Kind of highlights the, the footprint, um, but there's no reason why you can't go out in the middle of the afternoon. Exactly. Know, well, again, again you're also. Of- I think it, it's a lot of times people experience ghost sightings more at night because the rest of the distractions are lessened. You don't hear the dog barking and the neighbor working in the yard and the, you know, the cars driving by and the kids playing. So there's not all of these distractions, and at night you'll hear more of the extracurricular sounds that you wouldn't <laughs> notice during the day. So I think that's why most investigators do it at night is because it's, it is a, a much more um, quiet period where it's going to be a lot easier to discern different sounds and where they're coming from or what might be creating them than it would be any time during the day. So I understand it to a degree, but I've always said, listen, if, if people are seeing a ghost in their basement at three in the afternoon, I'm not going to show up at 10 o'clock at night with my team and investigate until three in the morning. I'm going to set up at about noon and start investigating during the heat of the day and see what happens. Why is it specifically during these points in the day that people are experiencing and witnessing them? And nighttime is our worst enemy as investigators. I think you'll agree, Brian. I mean, oh, it's yeah. so easy Absolutely. to make a mistake, especially in the field of, of uh, paranormal and ghost hunting. The lights flickering. You know, most people will see the shadow people in their house. When do they see them? When they're sitting in their living room with the lights off watching TV and the flickering of the light of the TV. And to the front of your eyes, you're not noticing the flicker nearly as much as the corner of the eyes, which are are a lot less sensitive. So they're going to pick up a lot more of that kind of flickering effect, and it's going to give false positives. You'll think something moved out of the corner of your eye. And and I've heard people go, but there were three of us in the room. Right. Well, you were all watching the same show, so the light effect was the same, the flickering was the same, and if all of your heads pivoted at the same moment, was it really a shadow person or was it – the play of light off the television and it reflected off of something in that room for a brief second that it gave, you know, gave the appearance of movement. So I, you know, I understand that. And especially outside in, in the, that would just totally unnerve me to be out hunting anything in the middle of the night. <laughs> but, uh, the low light settings are our worst enemy when it comes to truly investigating. I think we'd be better off with a lot more light and, um, less distraction. Um, uh, 
you know, while while you're investigating this, you're not sitting there worried what's coming up behind me. Are there other animals out here? I think it would give you a much better perception. And do we know anything? I mean, do any of the experts weigh in on the fact that Bigfoot is more nocturnal? Depends on what you mean by experts. I mean, everyone's an expert. Well, not I mean, really. Uh, I'm just no. I'm just. I'm being <laughs> facetious. Right. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I've read some horrible things that some people have written about their knowledge of Bigfoot, and it's all based on case reports. So, if you just take a case report at value, at face value, and you interpret it, and you start to use that as part of your your overall um, explanation for Bigfoot and his his daily duties. But you're not really digging into these cases deep enough and really determining the cause or the person behind it. You're not really doing yourself any justice. And, and all these, quote, facts that you're gathering are pretty much meaningless because you're just you're you allowing the, the client to really write your handbook here, which is, is dangerous. Exactly. You know, and what you said about investigating during the day, I mean, if you're doing it right and you're documenting, you should have somebody who's documenting everything, and mm-hmm. everybody should be aware, then do it. If the guy's mowing his, his, his lawn, you should know exactly how many times he went left to right. I mean, you should know that stuff because, you know, that's what we do in field work. We document, and then the rest, whatever we can't explain that's not documented, that's the stuff you search for. So Yeah, I've watched people, I've watched investigators go in, and I don't say anything, I just I witness, and I watch them go into a house and then black out the windows. And change the parameters of the setting or the investigate, you know, what was happening. Well, we're making it darker so that we can get a better field of view with the IR. And I'm like, but that's not how they witness the ghosts. If they're right. seeing something at 10 o'clock every night and you're shutting off parameters of what the house is normally like, you're going to now detract from what might be the natural elements. Is there a neighbor that comes home every night at this time and their headlights pan across the living room? Is there a reflection off a mirror or a window from across the street when somebody opens their garage door? You have to leave everything the way it is. So I I like you. I I love to sit back and watch other teams investigate. I think that's why I, 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 I was no longer asked to be on a lot of these investigations because afterwards they'll say, well, what do you think? And I'll say, well, it was really interesting. Well, what did you, I mean, we're pretty great about this, right? And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, I see a lot of inherent issues and, well, what issues? And I'll start listing them off as politely as I can. And I, I never get asked back for that team again. It's it's strange. Uh, yeah, you and me both. I've, I've had that happen. I don't know why. I'm just being, I was just being honest. Right. And you, you know, want, I've... you want the, the best for yourselves and your team. And I've had other, I've, after I've mentioned that before, teams will invite me out on it. Well, no, we want that kind of feedback. And then I've gone out and I've given them that right. kind of feedback. And the, <laughs> it's a fragile ego in this field, my friend, no matter yes, what angle absolutely. you're coming from, they, they don't like to hear that they made mistakes. And well, we never do that. That People, was, that was yep. just tonight. We were tired. Well, then you shouldn't have been here investigating. If you're tired, <laughs> oh, I had no. a bad day. You should be at home resting. Uh, listen, yeah, a lot it, of people it, will say that on the front side, but it, you're absolutely right. They'll say it on the front side, but then when you do it, they're like, how dare you? Right. <laughs> and we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Sure. You yeah. know, and, and, uh, and I'll, I'll do a shameless plug now because I've been mentioning it on air and I've still got a handful left. I was part of a TV show called Paranormal Challenge on the Travel Channel. Part of what intrigued me to do the oh, show yeah. was I, I was that. the lead judge, and I got to watch how teams investigated. I got to watch the way they used their equipment, the way they tried to uh, use uh, history from the locations, and then what was it that they brought back to us that they would deem to be paranormal in nature. And it was fascinating. It was a, it was a really great um, kind of bird's eye view into investigations. And you could see where some teams really shined, but they still made fatal flaw mistakes. And other teams that would bumble and stumble would capture some of the coolest evidence, but they didn't have a clue what they did or how they did it. <laughs> so right. that's fascinating. I do have copies, signed copies of the DVD, uh, complete mini series available. It's a three disc set, all 14 episodes. I've got them available right now. We can get them out before Christmas if you're interested. $30 for the set autographed. I also have my book, The Other Side, A Guide to Ghost Hunting in the Paranormal. $10 autographed. I can get you both out the door at $40 plus three ninety five shipping and handling. If you're interested in one or the other or the pair, just email me, dave at darknessradio.com. That's dave at darknessradio.com. And if you love the paranormal as much as Brian and I love the paranormal, then we've got the perfect site for you to visit. Go to darknessradio.com. 
click on our Killer Deals link. There are Christmas gift ideas there for everybody on your list. It's our complete Amazon page where we put together some of our favorite items, books, DVDs, old TV series, including the Leonard Nimoy In Search of Complete set, sightings. We've also got um, the Night Stalker series on there. We've got a lot of really cool series and uh, one-off movies. We've got t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, socks, you name it, and it's got a paranormal slant. We've got it on our page, and we go and handpick some of our favorites to be on there. Plus, there's some really great ghost hunting and cryptozoological hunting books and equipment for making your initiation into the research field just a little bit easier. So go check it out at darknessradio.com. Click on the Killer Deals link. We'll be back. We've got more to discuss with our guest Brian Parsons here on the Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. Beyond the Darkness. Hey, we're back. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. My guest today is Brian Parsons, PhD. He's here with us. I'm throwing out the PhD, Brian, just to kind of show that we get some pretty classy guests on here from time to time. Not always just a bunch of backwater, uh, moonshine swilling folk. Uh, you've got a bunch of books and we're going to have uh, all of the books on our, our page at Killer Deals. We'll have the three main handbooks, uh, handbook for the amateur UFO investigator, paranormal investigator, and, uh, cryptozoological investigator. We'll have all of those books up on our page. If you go to darknessradio.com, click on the Killer Deals link, you'll be able to find all three of the books available for you right there. Remember when you support that page, every purchase you make, a very small percentage goes to help keep this show afloat, pays a lot of our administrative costs, our streaming costs, allows us to keep the show free and keep it as limited on commercial ads as we possibly can. So keep making those purchases. The holidays are here. Buy those perfect paranormal gifts for your friends, relatives, neighbors, teachers, whatever you want. We've got it on that site. All right, Brian, I want to, I'm just having a fun time chatting with you. It's great to talk to a fellow investigator and researcher, somebody that has an interest in this. And I know we talked off air about, you know, some of the aspects of, of these claims and sometimes I'm more fascinated by what I think to sound the most absurd than I am about what, you know, if, if a guest is completely believable to me, that's great. But I'm almost more intrigued by the people that I speak to, and I'm wondering what you found in the research for your books. Sometimes when their stories are so absurd, and I think there's no way this can be true, I will begin hearing from people around the world about their own experiences with a very similar situation. And that has really kind of opened me up to a new paradigm in the way I think about about other people's experiences. Have you had kind of a light go on for yourself as well? I mean, you've been a host of a, a show now for, what, nine years? You've written six books. Are you ever kind of, you know, do you have to reel yourself back in from judging too much, or too much, nice command of English <laughs> language, from judging too much when you start to hear a story, no matter how absurd or, or bizarre it sounds? Uh, yeah, I have to say I'm I'm guilty of that, and... When I started out, I didn't have a belief in any of this stuff. And then I, I kind of became, I wouldn't call it a true believer, but pretty darn close. Some of the stuff I believed in, I didn't believe in camera orbs, for example. I didn't believe right. in any of that. But a lot of the other stuff, you know, I, I really fell into belief with. And it didn't take me too long to kind of become a little bit more balanced. And I consider myself uh, fairly balanced in this, probably a little bit more skeptical than a believer, only because – there's a lot of people that just believe anything and everything. So I, I feel like I have to, I have to be armed at that angle. And sometimes, you know, like you just said, it, it kind of works against you because then I'm a little bit maybe too critical of people's, um, opinions or experiences or their thoughts on the subject. And, you know, I, I may come across a, a little know it all or a little attackish. Is that a word? Attackish? I don't know what it Why is. Why not? If I'm, if I said much, then you can say attackish. I'm with you. <laughs> Sure. So, yeah, I, I'm a little guilty of, of doing that. And, you know, like you mentioned, doing research, doing research, I'd be honest with you, for this UFO book, I'm a member of a, of a local organization, and they're great people, and they mean well, and they believe what they believe. But I'll tell you, there was a few times I got a little nervous in that room, and I wanted to get up and run. And I'm like, <laughs> I hope I'm not going to become like this someday. You know, 
Why? What about that? Uh, what 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 about that <laughs> aspect is what you're referring to? I'm just curious what you've what insights you've well, had on that. Well, well, I'll tell I'll tell you a story, and I hope he's not listening. But the uh, you know it's a it's a nice group of normal people. I mean, they're just they have normal jobs. They're not psychopaths, at least I know. They're great people, and just kind of people you just meet anywhere and everywhere at the gas station, at the at the mall, anywhere. Um. Maybe not Walmart, but anywhere you'd meet these people and, and, you know, they're nice people. And then you start talking about the subject matter and, you know, the, the beliefs come out a little bit. And there's a little bit of, well, you know, I heard this on on this website or this and that. And you're like, OK, you know, I get it. You, you have a little bit of a fringe belief. And then once everything is comfortable, the middle of these meetings, start with their personal experiences. And this one gentleman claims that he's. Uh, worked on these secret um, retrofitted UFOs, and he he didn't really do like anything exciting. He I think he he worked on the landing gear, so it's something mundane. And he really truly honestly believes that he did this, and he's you know has all these facts, and he knows people that that have lived on Mars. And, and I'm just like, wow, you know, an hour ago you were like, I would have hung out with you, but now I'm not sure I want to be in the same room with you. It's just. It's just Come on, it's interesting Brian. how those people are much more fascinating than the ones that have no opinion on anything. <laughs> well, you're right about that, though. I, I agree with that. <laughs> right? but to to claim that you have these personal experiences is sometimes it's a little frustrating to me. But again, who, like you said, who am I to judge? Who am I to, to say that maybe he did do that? I, I can't say he didn't because if he's telling me he did, I have no choice but to believe him unless I have evidence to back it up that, that he didn't. But it's it's frustrating, but it's it's eye opening at the same time, and you're just like, wow, you know, people really have these beliefs about things, and you know, you listen to their experiences. A lot of people come there because no one else has listened to them, and they need a, a an area or a, a, a place to to talk about their personal experiences. And so, you know, when I judge this one person, and I hear somebody else who's just like, wow, you know, this is a room full of people that accepts me for who I am, and this is my experience and I, I I feel guilty. Like, man, I just got like mentally mad at this person. And then I hear this other person who's spilling their guts, embarrassed to, to tell their story. And then they feel accepted by the same people that I just judged. And that was kind of something that kind of helped put the, the, the book in perspective for me, instead of kind of going and being too skeptical, I, I kind of actually pulled the reins back a little bit on it and try to be a little bit more balanced. Cause I found myself writing it, way more way too skeptical i guess is what i'm trying to say and you know being a part of a little bit of zaniness actually helped me kind of pull back the the skeptical reins a little bit so yeah i've i've experienced that and you know, i'm still a member of the that organization still hang out with those guys i'll, I'll mention it it's the cleveland ufology project they meet uh, every third saturday at uh, cleveland community college in parma you're welcome to come out it's a it's a very oh, eclectic look at group you of giving people. them a little high high five. I know, why anyway. not? I just bashed him anyway. But no, <laughs> um, the, the the co-director of that is actually Thomas Wortman, who is the uh, MUFON director for the state of Ohio. So a little bit of a MUFON connection there too. But Cleveland Ufology Project has been around since 1952, so it's one of the oldest UFO research and investigation organizations in the world. So I'm I'm proud to be a member of that. Well, that's very it's crazy. cool. As now, crazy as we all are, but I, I want to know. You said you kind of came into this as a skeptical, as a skeptic. You become more. It sounds like me, a skeptical believer. What field has become the most believable for you? Cryptozoological, ufology, or the paranormal, the ghosts, uh, and spirituality aspect? Oh, boy, um, believable. Yikes. Uh, I don't know. It, it depends like on what aspect you mean, because like cryptozoology, I don't really honestly don't really have much stake in Bigfoot, even though people claim to see it. I don't think it's a physical entity and I don't think it's an interdimensional creature that some people think it is. Uh, I think it's more of a. Uh, I don't know what the term would be, almost kind of like a tulpa. It's almost like a mental uh it's a mental thing that we put out there and we see it because it's part of our perception. But, you know, you have other cryptozoological creatures that are a little bit more logical, um, things like the thylacine and Eastern cougar and uh, ivory-billed woodpecker, which are or normal animals, 
No, I believe in those, the p- potential. Um, ghosts, like, you know, that's a tough one because that's, you know, we've talked about that being almost a hallucination. So it's like, how do you, unless the problem with ghosts is we have to define consciousness before we can get to defining a ghost. We have to, we're trying to put the cart before the horse and it's not going to work that way. So we have a lot of other explaining to do before we can logically attack these other things that have plagued mankind for centuries. And you no know, UFOs, who, who knows about that either? You know, it's, it's that whole argument. Gosh, I hope we're not the most intelligent thing out there. But at the same time, you know, if there is a higher intelligence, how would they get here? You know, it's, it's very improbable when you really sit down and think about how far of a distance or how long it would take for us to get to one edge of the galaxy to the other, let alone going from universe to universe or, uh, you know, galaxy to galaxy. That's, it's just improbable. We, our minds can't even wrap how far that is or the distance involved or how much energy it would take for us to travel these vast distances. And it's just mind boggling. So like the more I study that aspect, the scientific aspect of of space travel, the less and less I believed in the ET visiting earth kind of thing. Um, Not that I think SETI is any more intelligent. I think that's kind of silly to, to waste our, just to zap a little thing out here into one tiny percentile of the, of the sky and expect a, a message back at any moment. But, um, so I don't know. I would have Why to say do you do this again, Brian? <laughs> I don't know. But it's, yeah, no, it doesn't sound, sounds horrible. I'm so skeptical, but you have to be. You have to be. Paranormal News Insider is hosted by Dr. Brian Parsons on Tuesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, we'll have a link up to that and his website so that you can follow along and keep up with him. We also have links up for his books on our page as well. So you can find that at darknessradio.com under the Killer Deals link. And have you had what you believe to be a paranormal experience, whether it be a, a witnessing what you might believe to be a UFO uh, or a ghost? And if so, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I've seen uh, I've seen quite a few things. And it's frustrating for me because I'm a... I'm not a, I'm not saying I'm a scientist, but I'm a person of science and I believe in being able to explain things. But there's been a number of times that I've seen things I just can't explain. Uh, I've seen shadows during investigations where, yeah, we were in the dark. It wasn't my choice. You know, I just took it as the, as the group collective right. that we're going to investigate that way. And I saw something and I tried to figure out where this light source was coming from. How, why is there a shadow creeping along this wall? And I thought, well, it's coming through the drapes. So I put my hand along the drapes, and the shadow just kept moving. So I went underneath it. I went above it. I went all around this thing, and I couldn't get it to go away. It was just this solid black mass on the wall, and I was just standing there like, do you see this? Do you guys see this? Like, what am I not doing? Like, help me figure this out. And we couldn't figure it out. And then it just disappeared into the wall, and I just stood there like, you got to be kidding me. I was, I was actually more mad. Like, everyone else was just like, petrified and staring at the wall like we all saw that like everybody there was i think four of us in the room and they all saw it and they were just all in awe and i'm I'm the only one walking around going why did you guys help me i'm trying to figure out what this is and i was i was just mad i ended up walking out of the house i was just so perturbed i actually went outside to look to see maybe there was a some kind of explanation that's just how i am i just i had to figure it out um i've also seen a very very weird creature and I was actually invited out to a location in Oklahoma, a tuberculosis hospital. And I went up to, uh, I was allowed to kind of go on my own, which they kind of didn't usually let people do, um, for various reasons, obviously, safety being one of them. And I was up on this, I th- believe it was the fourth floor, and I'm walking down the hallway. And I get to the edge of the, the room and it's blocked off at the edge of the stairway. You can't get down it. There's chairs and tables and stuff stacked in there. And, there's no way you could physically squeeze down to get to this other thing. There's just debris and just junk everywhere. So I turn around, I come walking down the hallway and I get the feeling I'm being watched. And I'm just like, oh, come on, Brian, this just, you're alone in this thing and it's dark. It's creepy. No. And there's cameras. There's some cameras around, but there was no cameras on that level. And all of a sudden I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to satisfy my curiosity and put my mind at ease. Cause I really feel like somebody's watching me. So I turn around and I look 
And I see something at the end of the hallway, and I'm like, eh, it's just something on the wall. And then I turn around, and I take two more steps and freeze. I'm like, no, there was nothing on that wall. So I turn around, and I look, and I see this all the way at the end of the hallway. It's pretty pretty long hallway. I, I don't can't remember the distance, but it's just like this. It looked like a head. And then all of a sudden, it was you know kind of like at a 45-degree angle. And all of a sudden, the head just slowly moved behind the wall. And I'm just staring like, did I just see that? There's no way. That can't be real. So I kind of like run down the hallway carefully because it was kind of dark and there was debris and junk on the floor. And I make my way down there and I'm looking around and I'm searching. I'm crawling on the floor trying to figure out what this thing was. And I can't figure it out. I can't find an explanation. So I walk down the hallway and I didn't get that creepy feeling again. And I go downstairs and I was there, gosh, probably 10, 12 hours and supposed to actually go to a, a conference the next morning. Um, about two and a half hours away. I never made it because I spent the entire night at this place. It was just fascinating. Uh, but we were talking shop after the, after the uh, investigation and I didn't mention it to anybody, but we were sitting there around in this garage that's behind it. And, and they just said, um, what's up at the fourth floor? And the, the guy looked at me and he said, uh, you saw it, didn't you? I was like, saw what? I was just playing stupid. And he, I think he used the term green goblin or something similar to that. And I was like, what, what do you mean? He's like, you saw it, didn't you? I was like, well, I saw something and I described what I saw. He's like, wow, you're very fortunate. You're only one of like every 15th or 20th person I ever visited has ever seen it. And only one other person that's an investigator has seen that. But the story is pretty valid that people see a very similar creature in that same exact area. But nobody's written about it. Nobody's talked about it. It's just a verbal thing. And they actually told me, don't ever tell the story. And now I'm telling the story. And I've told it for years at different <laughs> conferences. But They told me, don't tell was, the story. No, I'm telling yeah. the story. <laughs> but this, yeah, this was like uh, probably 17, 18 years ago. So I'm, I, I think uh, the last I heard that this building was uh, going to be demolished anyway. So well, what do you make of, of that? What do, what do you away. make of what you experienced? I, I don't know. That, that just, that's probably the biggest one that freaked me out because there is no explanation. Like it – it almost looked like an alien, but here we're in a tuberculosis hospital. Maybe it was somebody, it was a ghost of somebody who was sick. Maybe had, you know, skin discoloration. It was something that we talked about. Um, you know, what kind of a disease would make your skin turn like a, a yellow greenish, uh, I, I guess color or snot, I guess for lack of a better term, but it was just creepy and it, it was pretty far away, but you could tell it was a, a human shaped head. Didn't have any hair. Um, it didn't look like a, like a gray alien head, you know, the bubble shaped head with large eyes or anything. It looked like a human head, but it was real. I mean, it was creepy. It was solid. I mean, you couldn't see a shadow because there was no real backlight on it. And it just slowly slid behind the thing. And it was another one of those things where I had a flashlight in my pocket. Did I use it? No. Cause I was just observing what was happening. It was just, it was just spooky. It was weird. And to this day, it's just perplexed me. And I think, the reason why I started to talk about it was because it was bothering me. Like, what was this thing? And so I've talked to other people about it. And I don't know, one time I just let it slip at a library talk. And now here I am on national radio talking about it. So, eh, it happens. <laughs> I don't think they'll, I don't think they'll complain about it. So it was 17 or 18 years ago. I didn't use the name of the facility either. So maybe I'll get protected by that. But I've also seen a couple of strange things in the sky that I, I was not able to explain. Um, Best thing, and I've heard this a hundred times from people, out walking their dogs. And uh, unfortunately, my dog, she passed away from cancer a couple of years ago. But it was great to get out, to walk out with her and kind of uh, reset your mind and think about different topics and different things. And, and also to look at the sky. And it was one time we were walking and I look up and I see something moving along. And one of my favorite things to do is identify satellites. I, I love looking at it, especially, you know, you go out between – Usually about the hours of 10 o'clock to about midnight, the sun is setting and it's dark, uh, but that sunlight is still hitting the upper atmosphere. So it really reflects off of stuff and you really get that, that shine, you know, that shine down back on earth. And I look for that stuff. And um, here I see this, this light. I'm like, oh, it's got to be a satellite the way it's moving. And all of a sudden it stops and it backs up and it starts zigging and zagging all over the place. I'm thinking, okay, just my eye. It's just normal. It's okay. So I blink and I look down and I look back up and it's doing the same thing. And I'm looking around like, does anybody else see this thing? 
Like, what's going on? What am I seeing here? And it was frustrating because I couldn't figure out what it was. I had my phone. I pull it out. Um, I wouldn't do any justice to take a picture or a video. It was so small. Uh, but I, at the time, uh, it was the app Space Junk, which I don't think is supported anymore. It doesn't work. And I couldn't find there was no no satellite in the area. There was nothing there that I was what I was looking at shouldn't have been there. And again, it was one of those things where I was just perplexed. Like, what am I seeing? This it's irritating me because I can't explain it. Kind of thing. It's it's almost a feeling of helplessness because I'm used to being able to explain everything. And but it was at the same time I was looking at it, and I, I remember saying, "Wow, this is great." I lo- sometimes it's nice to see something that you can't explain and just enjoy that moment. And, it, you know, again, I was looking around, was hoping that somebody else would have seen it, but it was so high in the sky and so small, I, I seriously doubt anyone else probably was looking. When we're talking about investigating the paranormal and we're talking about looking into these different claims, there's so much that goes into it. But if you were going to give some listeners advice on how to start investigating something that they really are interested in, whether it's the ufology, the cryptozoology, or the spirituality. What are some of the tried and true first steps that you think would be a great way for them to indoctrinate themselves into the field? Well, honestly, I have to say, it's like I said, it's easy to believe, but it's hard to be skeptical. I would honestly suggest looking at the skeptical viewpoint first. And getting a, a feel for how these things can be explained by those who have a knowledge of the scientific process and and how to explain these things. And one book off the top of my head, uh, Scientific Paranormal Investigation by Benjamin Radford, a very, very good book. And you would think that the skeptics are the enemy, which a lot of people think that way. But really and truly, people like Benjamin Radford and uh, Sharon Hill – and some of the other skeptics that are out there actually want us to, to succeed, but they want us to do it in a, a little bit more organized fashion. And so with Benjamin Radford's book, Scientific Paranormal Investigation, he kind of lays it out, um, not exactly how we should be doing it, but the things that we're doing wrong. And it's really up to us to figure out how to do it right. So if you learn from other people's mistakes, which you will learn through the skeptical viewpoint, It'll actually help you get to the the path that you need to do because, unfortunately, we see, and I'm sure you agree, we see a lot of people that emulate what they see on television right. as being the right way to do things. And, you know, I'm sure you've had a 100 guests on here that have bashed the TV shows and complained about that. And, you know, the TV shows are just part of it. But the other part is also the Internet where you're getting your information from. So if you can learn the skeptical viewpoint, it's so much easier. We're all exposed to the way things are done on television as well as how other people are doing it on the internet. But you owe it to yourself to really learn that skeptical viewpoint or that those things that we're not doing correctly. So you can start off on the right foot. And see, I think the problem truthfully, and, and I know I'm going to probably offend quite a few of my listeners by saying this, Brian, but the fact is people don't like to read anymore. Yeah, you're right. For the majority. They want, okay, I saw it on TV, so I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy a thermal camera, and I'm going to buy a night vision camera, and I'm going to buy night vision goggles, and I'm going to buy hip waders and a floppy hat, and now I'm a Bigfoot investigator, right? Or I'm going to get a K2 meter, and I'm going to, and they don't even really understand what the equipment is, how it works, or why it works. And, and I think that that is a big issue. And I, I often tell people, Hey, I love having you come out to my live events. And this is a good chance for people that are new and want to investigate in a safe environment to come out with a bunch of people who care and want to teach you and want to spend some time with you. I wouldn't put yourself into people's houses trying to aid them when your only real pedigree is that you own every series of Ghost Hunters, Ghost Adventures, and Most Haunted on DVD. That doesn't make you a paranormal investigator any more than it makes me a cop because I own all the series of Starsky and Hutch and NYPD Blue, right? Absolutely. (laughs) You've got to you've got to do your due diligence. You have to do your research. Listening to shows like this is helpful. But again, it's it's you know a cursory look and a glance. You you really need to kind of dip in deeply, and that's why people like Brian and myself have written books so that you can understand why we do what we do, how we do what we do. And yeah, I know you mentioned Ben, ben Radford, and he is definitely one of the more tolerable skeptics out there. And we've had Ben on our show a number of times. Uh, 
I think people automatically hear the word skeptic and they think, you know, spat it out like it's a dirty word. We all need to be skeptics. You need to question the experience. It doesn't mean you have to beat yourself up, which I do. I've had the most insane experiences, Brian. I share a lot of them on our show here, especially on our theater of the mind segment. And, uh, there's things I just can't debate. I can't brush off as just, you know, uh, a, a, a trick of lights or, uh, you know, my imagination. There's no way to get past it, but it doesn't mean I don't sit there working it over in my mind constantly trying to find some kind of real answer for this that, that goes beyond the realm of the supernatural. And and when I'm left, they're stupefied, and I talk to people about it, and I get some insights, and then I can bring them to the location and go, see, your your hypothesis isn't holding up. There was This wasn't happening. There is none of that here, you know, <laughs> and then you can kind of work it through. That's helped me kind of grasp the concepts. And I, I think if people are fascinated and they've had experiences or they've witnessed and watched these shows and they just want a taste of something beyond their normal everyday life, I encourage people to investigate, get out and see this because let's face it, ghost stories are some of the best ways to learn history ever created. As a matter of fact, if schools were smarter, they would teach paranormal history and talk about the ghosts of Gettysburg to teach kids why Gettysburg is so important or why Nuremberg is so important or why, you know, Auschwitz is so important. By telling these stories, as Jeff Belanger says, it's, you know, ghosts are history's way of reminding us where we've been. And I think we could really wrap up some history and education in fun ways for people instead of just the old book learning if we tied it into to the different aspects of the paranormal and how we've learned from that going forward. I don't know, as a PhD, do you see that there might be other ways to teach things and make it a lot more palatable? I mean, absolutely. And and I have to admit, I'm guilty as well. Before I got into ghost research, I really didn't honestly care that much about history. I really didn't. I mean, a little bit, but not absolutely not as much as what I do now. You know, I find myself researching uh, even pirate history, but not for pirates, but because of different things tied into ghosts. And then I end up, you know, going down a different road and getting involved in uh, different stuff. I, I buy books on Egypt, ancient Egypt, not for uh, Tutankhamun, but for some other cultural things about ghosts and their interpretations of the afterlife. And, you know, then you go down these other paths and you start to l- fall in love with history. And like you mentioned, um, Civil War battle sites. I, I never really, honestly, and, and I, I feel ashamed, you know, being an American by saying this, but I didn't really care about the Civil War before I got into ghosts. But now I have a, a very different appreciation for history, not just because of ghosts, but because of where we've been, like you said. And I think there's absolutely a different way. And if we have to use ghosts, why not? I think it's a brilliant way to to bring people around. And you look at like what's going on now with um the president saying that we're going back to the moon and we're going to Mars. That's the first thing that came to my mind is great. This is what kids need to get back to wanting to be astronauts and want to learn about science. Like I was when I was a kid watching the space shuttles go, you know, into lower earth orbit. And it was inspiring to us, but to actually go to the moon, you know, this happened before I was even born and my parents went through it and it influenced them. So I'm excited about that. So if we can exactly do something to tie in history and ghosts, who knows? We can spawn new scientists and people that are looking at things differently. And, you know, as long as they don't expel another planet to make it a, a, a small exoplanet, then good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, maybe <laughs> exactly. we're making some some progress with science. And, you know, what's going on with this? This uh, space race now is, is exciting, and yeah, I wish we had something more along the lines of, of tying ghosts. That's a that's a brilliant idea. Wish I was a professor, then maybe I would do that. That's a it's a brilliant uh, avenue, and I think we should do that. Um, right. Well, there's so much, so many aspects. Listen, you're trying to teach history. You're trying to teach what the culture was like at that time. Talking about Roswell and the UFO crash. That's a great in to grab kids' attention. There was a UFO, oh, allegedly. But now what else could it have been? During this time in history, you know, World War II, could it have been 
you know, spy ships? Could it have been this? You realize we were in the midst of a world war that had begun over in Germany, and then you slowly feed people around that story. I've often thought there's just there would be much better ways. As I watch my kids, you know, some of them struggling in school because they're bored by the the way things are taught. Um, I just think there's there's some really compelling nature, and when I can sit down with my kids and I start to regale them with stories of Waverly Hills and tuberculosis clinics and what it was really like and what kind of experiments they did and what history shows us and how far we've come, suddenly they have a real appreciation for that aspect. And that's what investigating is really about, right? We're, we're basically packaging, uh, you know, the medicine with spoonfuls of sugar around it. And if people take the time to educate themselves on this, you can have a lot of fun learning. And you don't have to dwell and think, oh, God, I don't have to power through this book. Most paranormal books are written, especially the ones to teach you. They're still written giving you some parables along the way, and they're giving you some of the stories you seek so ardently and want to read about. So it's it's great to get out there and research this stuff and find out why would this take place. If, if a haunting was going to take place in in a location like Waverly Hills or Gettysburg or, or um, you know, the, the Queen Mary, why would it be so conducive for, for investigations? And then listen to some of the claims. Stop believing everything you hear. Could it really be because there's heavy limestone and granite and quartz? Why don't you look up limestone, granite, and quartz and find out what some of the properties and principles are? Can they actually be used for energy transference? And if so, maybe that starts to build uh, you know, aside for you on, on whether the paranormal is real or not. I think, you know, that's what a lot of people miss out on. And I hope they start reading books like yours and, and Ben Radford's and mine and, and others that have been written so that they can get the perspectives and hopefully educate, enlighten and entertain themselves along the way. Yeah. But unfortunately the people that need to read the books are the ones that are not reading the books. <laughs> uh, you know, as, and as far as education is concerned, until we can start making it to where, we're teaching kids to teach them information instead of just to pass the, pass a test. You know, I think that's the first step. But uh, and I would I would make you my secretary of education in a heartbeat if I was president. Well, let's get uh, you on the ballot then. <laughs> let's get you on the ballot. <laughs> sure. If Trump can do it, I'm sure I could do it. So you've had experiences with shadow people, with some kind of creature, whether it's alien or interdimensional, or even just a bent up, you know. TB patient that was dying of consumption at the time, you know, what, what is it that you were looking at and reviewing? And for people that think, oh, how could that look alien in nature? If you look at um, the movie Pet Cemetery, I believe her sister was dying of tuberculosis in that movie. Or, or no, no, it was uh, some kind of spinal, gosh, I can't remember. But you can see how the human body can twist up and look very frightening dealing with different medical maladies. So what is it that you're experiencing in these situations, and why are they there? And if we truly want to communicate with the other side, we have to understand why the other side would be there and what the message is that they may be trying to tell us. I mean, absolutely. And I tell you, with my experience when I saw that, I didn't think ghost. I didn't think tuberculosis patient. I actually thought alien was the first thing that popped into my mind, and that was why when this person described this alien creature to me, I was like, how did he know that? I saw this alien because it didn't appear to be ghost. You know, I wasn't thinking ghost at the time. And you would think I would be because that's what, what we you were doing there. there. But, right. Yeah, but, <laughs> well, no, but, it didn't fit the par- but it didn't fit the paradigm of what a ghost should look like to you either. It right, wasn't a exactly. shimmery, white, opaque ghost. It wasn't a sheet floating down the hall with two <laughs> holes cut in it. It wasn't uh, a quickly darting shadow. This was something entirely different. But again, then what is it? Maybe we're mistaking ghosts. Maybe it is some kind of interdimensional being, and we're just thinking that they're the ghosts. There's something that was remnants of us at one time. Uh, you know, I, it, that's what fascinates me about a lot of this as well. And you t- you hear, um, you know, and we've been doing the show for a long time, you hear claims of people that have seen shape-shifting ghosts that seem to take different properties. Well, are they... You know, aliens supposedly have some kind of telepathic communication with a lot of the people they encounter. Are they picking up on what's in your mind? Are they projecting themselves to look like something recognizable to you? Right. Uh, we've encountered uh, ghosts that were the same person, but at different ages. Right. So how is that possible? You know, if if we project, if even if we're projecting ourselves as what we want people to see, which is the explanation I usually give people when they ask me, well, why are ghosts wearing clothes? They should be naked because clothes can't 
you know, transfer to the other side. And you say, well, we're projecting our image or we're perceiving from whatever kind of energy and energy used as a, as a loose term here that's stuck in the environment. So it's one way or the other. We don't know how it works, but we just know that there's some sort of projection, whether it's to or from. And that's why these, these clothes are here, but how could this energy project itself at different ages or as a different form or why is it wearing a certain clothing? You know, and how can you have a converse, a, a logical conversation with something that's just residual energy? It's, it's mind boggling. And it's, it's, gosh, you just want to find out, like, wish you could just zoom forward in time, you know, 500 years or however long it's going to take to figure all these things out about consciousness and all these things and just get the answer. And even though I wasn't allowed to tell anybody, I would love to know how all this stuff works because it's just so mind boggling and it's, it's just, it does. It defies physics. It defies what we know. And that's why it's paranormal. It's beyond normal. It's beyond science. And maybe until the, we start solving these things one by one, we'll never know the whole picture. Maybe the idea, though, Brian, isn't to solve it. Maybe it isn't to have to look deeper into it. Maybe the idea is to see, experience it, and be open to the realm. You know, the minute we start trying to overanalyze something, and it's it's okay to question and be skeptical of it, and if you can make a generalization and say, hey, you know what, I, there's cars up and down the street all the time. Okay, that's great. That may have been what just caused that phenomena that you just saw. But, you know, maybe sometimes our minds are closed because we are overthinking situations. And maybe the experiences are right there, but when we kind of laser focus on on one aspect of the story, we're focusing on one small piece of an upside-down puzzle, and we're trying to put together an entire picture. Whereas if you just kind of relax and let it unfold, maybe the rest of the picture reveals itself to you. Yeah, but I'd rather not wait till I'm dead to find out. Right. No, I don't mean that even. <laughs> I mean, key, I mean yeah. in life. I, I often wonder if chasing the spirits and trying is what, causes us to miss what's going on. You know, Jeff Belanger and I did an investigation. We were at the, um, we were in uh, uh, Virginia City. We were doing the jail, and we were stuck there for eight hours investigating with groups of people. And coming into the last hour or so, the two of us are exhausted, and we're sitting on the floor, and people are wandering around investigating. And at the same time, both of our heads move, and we look up on the upper level, and we saw a full figure, a full shadow figure, walk out of a cell and walk into another cell. And we looked at each other and we looked around and we could see everybody. Everybody was accounted for on the main level or the level below. And and we were so tired. I go, did you see that? He goes, yeah, I think I saw that. And I go, huh. Oh, well. You know, by the time we get up there, it's going to be gone anyway. And we just kind of laughed about it. But it was like when we weren't up there finally researching and looking, we stood back from it. That's when we actually had probably one of the most profound moments. We just saw it, and we accepted it, and that was the end of the story. And it was a cool visual, and we saw it, and there's no denying. And two of us saw it happen at the exact same moment. So there was something really kind of uh, special about that. And and how many people have the experience when they're not looking? Oh, it happens all the time. That's right. the best time. Setting up equipment, tearing equipment down, or having a casual conversation, that's usually when things happen. And when uh, I I – closed down my group after 15 years in 2011 uh, for a lot of reasons, just internal, external. And I tr started to focus on my research and, and trying to come up with trying to figure out where I went wrong because I really felt like I wasn't investigating the way I really had wanted to. And the interview process went out the window and we we're just kind of falling in line with the TV shows. And I was like, how did I let this happen? So I kind of went back to the drawing board and that's where um, I guess my my fourth book, the E4 method, that's where that came from. And the E4 method is essentially my client based research model, my, my methodology that I created. And one of the key aspects to this is what I call what I've coined the elusiveness factor. And this is when, uh, and scientists have seen this too, because of with paranormal phenomena, and this is the, what the skeptics use against the people that believe is, that the more science, the more critical speculation you have on a ghost, the less likely it is to occur. And skeptics will say, well, that's because uh, it's not real and it's not really happening. And when you start to look at it, it goes away because of, well, science. And I don't buy into that. I, I really think that there is something 
beyond intelligent. I mean, it's intelligence, but there's something that's attached to us that it's feeding off of, that it knows when we're concentrating and it knows when we're looking and it knows when we want to record stuff and it knows when we don't care. It knows when we're not paying attention. That, that's when these things happen. And, you know, I went back in history. You're talking about history again. Uh, a man named Kenneth Batcheldor, who did a lot of research on table tipping sessions and actually the sociological aspect, which is what really drew me in. How do these people act when they're around the table when these things happen? And how, how do, you know, how is the reaction when things do happen? And you've probably heard of the Toronto for Society, uh, psychical research, uh, TSPR. Right. Uh, experiment with Philip. Well, he is pretty much the forerunner to the Philip experiment, which I have to say on the side, I did a conference this year where I actually got to touch the, uh, the table that they did the Philip experiment. The last few years of the Philip experiment, which lasted 10 years. I was really giddy about that. It's the weirdest things that we get excited about here in the ghost <laughs> field. But, but um, you know, he was looking at the people, and it's interesting to find out that there's actually uh, him and uh, a guy named Colin Brooks Smith wrote an article. It's you can find it in the uh, uh, ASPR journals somewhere out there. I have it's on the, it's online as well. It's called the um, the rules for sitters, and essentially it's um, I think it was fifty different basically directives that if you follow these directives, this is how you get good kind of an atmosphere for things to happen. So I took this rules for sitters and I kind of reformed it. I kind of updated it and I kind of formed it more for the client base situation. And it's more of a relaxed atmosphere. It's, it's jovial. It's uh, getting to know the people you're investigating with. It's relaxing and having fun, just like you said, and it works. And even if people were to take the rest of my E4 method and throw it out the window, which I've actually say in the book, uh, and you just focus on these rules, you will have things that happen that you would never even imagine you could get to happen if you just follow these simple things. And, you know, it's not obviously it's well, not don't the most tease popular us with thing that. out there. But. Right. Give us a couple of the rules just so people have something that, to taste. Uh, well, like, you know, like I mentioned, it's it's about using the same people. Over and over again, it's about uh, not being, you know, we, we go into an investigation and we want to go and we want to go for two or three hours and then call it a night and then go and look at our data and see what we can correlate. Well, you're not going to find it one time out. And if you do, you're doing something wrong. I'm just going to say it. Uh, so it's about going and doing the same thing over the Philip experiment. It actually took them. They met every week for five years and nothing ever happened. It was their persistence. And their willingness to change and their willingness to adapt, that is when things started to happen. And that's when they actually they started to study um, Kenneth Batchelor's work and realized that, hey, we got to loosen it up. We just got to have fun. And that happy-go-lucky attitude is probably one of the major pieces here. And obviously, you've got to be serious about what you're doing and respectful toward the clients and respectful toward uh, the environment and things like that. But if you're loose – and you're having fun, that's when these things happen. Not when you're all uptight and you're looking around and you're freaking out about everything. Um, it's, it's that, it's just basically an attitude. I mean, the, the rules are pretty dry. Um, but essentially, you know, the same people, a loose atmosphere, being, um, not critical of each other, but observant and not observing where you think things are going to happen directly. Because we all know that that's a, a faux pas. When you think something's going to happen and you focus on it, that's when it doesn't happen. Well, that's already been a rule. It's been established for 40 years. Ghost hunters don't know that because they don't, they don't read that, the material that's out there. And when I read this, I was like, wow, it took me all this time to realize this. And this was already here. All I had to do was pick up a book and read it. So I was just as guilty. Uh, but it was something that I learned in the field that it was right there in a sentence that all I had to do is, you know, read it. So. It's these little rules, these little things that if you follow them one by one, and I broke them down too because in their work, it's just kind of a spattering of all these rules, and I kind of bounce around, and I kind of separated them into – um, can't remember off the top of my head. But basically, attitude, attitudes toward each other, 
uh, the social, the, the atmosphere itself and the social piece, you know, how we interact with each other. So different kind of groupings of these rules that if you combine them all together, you, it's not like having to memorize it. It's just kind of a, almost like a way of life. If you adapt these into your day to day investigations, that you'll start to notice that you'll, you'll actually have better luck and that you'll overcome this elusiveness factor that really unfortunately limits us. You know, when we freak out, when we see something, we yell, dude, run. That's <laughs> absolutely the worst thing you can do because you're acknowledging what's happening and you're, you're basically ceasing everything that could have been happening instead of just saying, okay, cool. I see something. Something's happening. Let's go with it. Let's keep doing what we're doing. You know, why would you want to change that atmosphere? You already, you stumbled onto something. It's something is occurring. Whatever you did worked. Why would you freak out and, and run or scream and run out of the room? It, it's, that's what you're there for, right? Yeah, right. So, you're there you know, to investigate yeah, it. So, but you know, we, that's why I said at the beginning, you know, we know the protocol yeah. of why we're going into a ghost hunt, why we're going into ufology and, and looking for UFOs or aliens. But then my my question was, well, what do you do if you run into a Bigfoot or or a ghost or an alien? Are you really prepared for the moment that may come? And I don't think a lot of people are. And I hope people start to take that a little bit more seriously to understand. And I always ask people, too, why are you in it? If you're trying to cash in and think you're going to be a millionaire by being a professional ghost hunter, that isn't going to happen. That happens to one half of one half of one percent of the people out there investigating the paranormal. And, you know, if you're, if you're out there doing it to try to educate and enlighten yourself and have some fun, which I think is the key element you just brought up. I think that's when you'll start to have experiences. And it's been when I've had some of the most fun in my life that I've had the weirdest things ever occur that uh, have left me dumbfounded. Yeah. And uh, being an author also won't make you rich. No, (laughs) it won't. (laughs) But Not check out his far. books anyway. Handbook for the amateur UFO investigator, for the cryptozoological investigator, for the paranormal investigator. We've got links up at darknessradio.com. Click on the killer deals link to find the books there. Uh, tell people about your uh, radio show and what they can hear and when they can hear you. Well, I host the Paranormal News Insider, which is hosted every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. I have a a really wacky job. I have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, so that's why I have a kind of a wacky time slot. But it's available uh, iTunes and Podbean and everywhere you you download anything or look for uh, podcasts. And if you want to listen live, you can listen live at WCJVRadio.com. Again, every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern the paranormal news insider and i've been doing that show for nine years now we had uh i started out as a monthly podcast it was just a segment that i pre-recorded a lot of work a lot of pre pre pre-work to do that but uh then we went on a am radio station which was a lot of fun for a couple of years and now i'm a standalone show a one hour time slot it's it's a lot of fun doing live radio because you never know what could happen and That's you can also right. find the the website at paranewsinsider.com and all of the uh, social media, Facebook and Twitter is also paranewsinsider. So check it out. Yep, then we've got links up to that so you can click on it right here on today's show. So that'll be available for you. And if you like what you hear on Beyond the Darkness, you're going to love what you see. I'm part of a program on Footprint dot tv you can go check it out for yourself the dark zone has a home at footprint dot tv we've got a program that's going on right now called is it real talking about what we've just discussed uh, myself along with five other paranormal experts from different paranormal shows have come together to review some of the most controversial pieces of evidence that uh, people have been posting on the internet and, and passing around. We take a look at it. We weigh in. What do we find intriguing about these? What do we think is being easily mistaken for something else? Uh, there's, I think, six or seven episodes up currently. You can go check them out for yourself. They're micro episodes. They're anywhere from about five to ten to twelve minutes long. And you can check them out for yourself at footprint.tv. Click on the dark zone. And not only will you find is it real there, but you'll also find out the you'll find the haunted mind episode with Kristen Lumen, You'll find the um, Stanley Hotel ghost uh, stories there as well. There's a lot of cool stuff, and you can go check it out for yourself. That's it for tonight on the Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. We will be back tomorrow right here on Beyond the Darkness.